Hi, I'm Ken Rockwell. I'm going to give you some tricks and secrets to the Canon EOS R3 for operation. Here's a little tutorial. To be honest, those of you who own this are big boys. All the specifics are actually at my website, kenrockwell.com. I'm just going to cover some of the basics that are unique to the EOS R3, different from the rest of the Canon EOS R system. I have all the links in my description, but if you look at my EOS RP user's guide, my R5 guide, my R6 guide, and my original EOS R user's guide, I have far, far, far more details for those of you who are new to this system. Things like how to use the FV exposure mode, how to use the C1, C2, and C3 modes, and all that, those are covered in those other guides. Again, this is what's specific. For instance, and we're all different too. For instance, I don't shoot video with this, so I program my movie button to be a play button. And that way, when I'm shooting with one hand, I can do that without having to reach over there. We're all different. But here's what I do, and hopefully you'll find this handy. First off, let's get this sucker charged. Now, if it was in 1990s, you would use the included plug-in-the-wall charger and charge it separately, but it's not the 1990s. Honestly, you can do what you want, but I prefer to charge it through the USB PD input. Now, the USB PD input... I find that it won't charge from any USB-A source. In other words, the old-fashioned USB connections, if you have an adapter, it's not going to work. It needs at least a USB-C source. You don't really need USB-C PD power delivery, but it does have to be from USB-C. I love using my little jackery thing here because I can just carry this any place I'm working out in the field, and it just goes. I don't have to reach under places and find things. The most efficient way to charge from this is not use the AC outlets to use the AC charger. I simply just plug into the power delivery port here, plug it into here, and it charges. And guess what? I can confirm that it charges quite well for my 20-watt Apple USB-C power adapter that came with my iPhone. It also charges great from the rear seat USB-C outlets in a 2022 Porsche. It also charges great from the USB-C PD outputs of my Anchor 20,000 milliampere hour power bank, or honestly, even plugged into the Thunderbolt 3 ports of my 2017 MacBook Pro. It'll suck about 15 watts of power out of any of these sources and charge at the battery in my R3. I find it takes about four hours, starting from a completely dead battery, to get to completely 100%. When the manufacturers talk about charging times, they're usually talking about only getting to 80% or so. Because as battery engineers know, it takes a long time to get the last few percent in because it slows the charging rate so the battery doesn't explode. For image stabilization, you use the switch on the lens. But if you're using an unstabilized lens like this, then... Oh, by the way, I programmed this little mother function button here to be my menu button. So here's my menus. Now, I programmed it in my My Menu... So I can turn off image stabilization, right, like this. But guess what? Canon hides this. Where you normally find this is if you go to the menu system, and you can hit this Q button, gets you quickly among the big categories here. Camera page 8 is where the stabilizer option is, right here. But guess what? If you have a stabilized lens, this option will simply disappear from the menu system like it didn't even exist. So unless you program it into your My Menu, where it's grayed out with a stabilized lens, if you have a stabilized lens, you go looking to set it in the menu system, it simply won't be there and you will go crazy. That's a little weird, but that's what they do. Guess what? The thing to know about stabilization that Canon doesn't make that clear is the in-camera stabilization works always with the lens's built-in stabilization if the lens is stabilized. You can't turn off one system. You can't use only optical or only the sensor shift with a stabilized lens. It's either all on or all off. So the switch on the lens also controls the camera's built-in stabilization with a stabilized lens. That's why that menu option disappears. You can't turn off the in-camera stabilization and only use optical. With an unstabilized lens, that's the only time you get the option because the only stabilizer is the in-camera stabilizer. How to get to 30 frames per second? Well, guess what? The good news is it works with any auto or manual ISO up to ISO 204,000 with full lens corrections and tracking autofocus. However, you have to set the high-speed drive mode. You can find it in the menu system at camera page 7, or you can find it at the quick control screen. You have to select H+, high speed plus continuous. That's 30 frames per second. These other options are slower. Then you have to set the electronic shutter. And again, most of these settings are available in several different places. The electronic shutter, shutter mode, you have to set that to electronic Otherwise, the mechanical shutter only goes to 12 frames per second. You also have to turn off anti-flicker shooting, which is the mode that makes the camera delay just a fraction of a second to catch the peak of each flicker of lighting. But needless to say, that also makes it slow down. And that is in camera page 3, turn off anti-flicker shooting. You also have to shoot at shutter speeds of 125th of a second or faster. At 1 100th of a second or slower, there's just not enough time left in a second to make 30 frames of those 
as well as do everything else the camera has to do. It won't work that quickly with flash. With manual flash, I can get up to 24 frames a second. And heaven help you, if you're trying to use TTL flash exposure control, it'll turn off even more. Now, you can... I don't think everyone needs to do this, but I also shoot without distortion correction when I'm shooting at 30 frames per second just because I know that it takes more processing power, which is burning up a little more battery power, and not that I've seen any difference, but it reminds me of my dad who rotated the hood ornament on a rented Lincoln Continental by 90 degrees back in 1973 that cut the wind resistance to give us a little more miles between fuel fills. So dad was kidding, but you know that's your choice. Just know that it does take some processing power. What's important is getting that live RGB histogram as we're shooting. You need color histograms. By default, it's off. The way to turn it on, quite simply, is camera, page 9, shooting info display, histogram display, then you have to select RGB. And also, I prefer the small size, which I think is just fine for reading a histogram. The large size takes up too much space. Now, I kid you not, remember I was talking about how much I love my C1, C2, and C3 modes? Well, guess what? The C2 and C3 modes don't work unless I have to call Canon to ask him this because you could read the instruction book, which is 1,037 pages long, but it wasn't obvious to me. What Canon does on their pro cameras is they actually lock out those modes to keep things a little faster for you. So you have to go in and turn it back on. The way you activate those modes is you have to go to the custom settings. You have to go to page two. You have to go to restrict shooting modes. You see all these? I have them activated now. You have to activate these. And then you have to remember, like Simon says, you have to remember to hit OK. Now you have C1 and C2 work properly. Exposure. The only thing to know about exposure that's unusual is using eye control for autofocus, you do tend to get that selected autofocus area as a priority with the metering system. Now, because eye control is so incredibly fluid and moves the selected spot around so unconsciously, you will get varying exposures of the same subject as your eye is thinking about different parts of the scene. So if for some reason you're thinking about the dark part of the scene, the light part of the scene as you're shooting, the exposure is going to go up or go down. So just know if you're getting inconsistent exposures from frame to frame and you're using eye control, think twice. Make sure to look at what you really want to get the right exposure. Otherwise, you could get that difference from frame to frame. To get long exposures, the best way to do that, you don't need a release, you don't need anything now. You want to set the camera to the bulb mode. And we're going to use what they call a bulb timer. To get the bulb mode, it's not a shutter speed. You actually select it as an exposure mode. Boom, bulb, thank you. And then we go into the menu, and it's in camera page seven. Get the camera this way, seven, bulb timer. You enable it, and then you set your exposure time, and then when you hit bulb, you use the self timer. So hit the shutter, two seconds later, whatever you set, then bulb will go off and it will time whatever exposure you programmed in there up to 100 hours long. They get the voice recorder to go. You see this little button here? You want to control what that button does. I prefer to set that button so that if I hold it down, it records. And if I just tap it, it plays. To do that, we go into the play menu, page four. And we set the button function here. I prefer that. That means if you tap the button, it plays back. And if you hold it down, it records. And only does that while you're actually on a, on a shot image. Like here's a shot image. If I hold this now, Hello, I'm recording a memo. One, two, three. Now you see that that little thing popped up there? That little note means you've got a voice note. Now if you press this again. Hello, I'm recording a memo. One, two, three. Fun. <laughs> to make the GPS go, it isn't on by default. You have to select the network communications menu, GPS settings, Mode 1 means that it's always working, even when the camera's off at regular intervals, so it always knows where you are. If you set Mode 2, it doesn't work when you're not actually turned on, which means typically when you, if you're turning power on on the camera, then pff, it probably won't know where it is for the first few frames. I find that annoying as heck. I remember I had some point and shoots that did that back in 2009, and it never worked in that mode. Saving settings to and from the card. I always recommend this. You know how long it takes to get your camera set up the way you like it when it's new? I would save this once you get your new camera set up. And this way, if you lose your camera or whatever, you can always get back to it. The way you get to this is you get it in the wrench menu, page five. Save load to card. Here you go. And I've got some recorded on my card. You can save these to your computer. You can actually find my personal settings on my website at kenrockwell.com and download them into your camera if you want. Just copy it from however you download it. And it's not going to do anything on your web browser. Just copy it onto your card at the top level of the directory, stick the card in the camera, and off you go. That's it. Those are some little tricks that are unique to the R3. Thank you very much for watching Ken Rockwell. All the full details are up at KenRockwell.com, and all the links are in the description. Thanks again for watching.